Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're looking at a really interesting shift in eye surgery, um, specifically how cataract removal isn't just about basic vision correction anymore. That's right. It's really evolved into what we call a refractive procedure. Patients today, well, they expect perfect vision. Seamless vision, right? Across all distances. Exactly. Reading fine print, working on a computer, checking your phone, driving at night. They want it all without glasses. And that's a huge ask. It puts a lot of pressure on the technology, the intraocular lenses, the IOLs. It does. We've had multifocal lenses, EDF lenses, mm -hmm. extended depth of focus, but they all came with, well, compromises. Yeah, compromises. That's really the heart of the problem the sources we're diving into today are trying to solve. Okay, let's unpack this. So if you look at the uh, the traditional diffractive trifocal IOLs, okay. they give you three focal points, distance, intermediate, near, but how they do it? By splitting the light with sharp transitions. Like tiny steps inside the lens. Exactly like steps. That splitting action, it inherently reduces contrast sensitivity. And more importantly for patient happiness, it creates visual disturbances. The halos and glare everyone talks about. Precisely. Yeah. Especially noticeable in low light, like when you're driving at night. Yeah. Big issue. Okay, so three peaks of vision, but you pay a price in visual quality, sort of, visual noise. What about EDF lenses? They aim to smooth that out. They did. EDFs offer a smoother transition, less like sharp steps, maybe more like a gentle slope. So fewer visual disturbances, which is good. But there's always a but, isn't there? There usually is. The trade-off with EDFs is often the near vision. They might give you great computer vision, that intermediate range, but really fine print, like uh, reading medicine bottle instructions. You might still struggle. So the holy grail is getting that full range, distance to near, without the glare and halos, and without sacrificing that crisp near vision. That's the goal. And this is where the Raywan Galaxy IOL comes in. Our sources present it as a totally new approach. Yeah, it's described as a new class, a full range of vision spiral IOL. Spiral. So the key difference is it uses refractive spiral tracks, not those diffractive steps we just talked about. Correct. No diffractive elements. And what's really fascinating here, according to the sources, is how it was designed. Ah, yes, the AI. Exactly. It wasn't just engineers sketching things out. They used proprietary artificial intelligence. The AI's task was to figure out the geometry needed to create a, quote, Continuous variance of power. Continuous variance of power. Okay, what does that mean practically? It means the optical surface transitions power gradually. No abrupt shifts, no sharp edges like the diffractive steps. Yeah. Think of it like a very precisely engineered, smooth, refractive ramp. And avoiding those abrupt shifts is key because that's what causes light scatter, right? Leading to the halos and glare. That's the theory. So this design aims for that continuous range of vision while minimizing those visual side effects, the dystotopsia, and also reducing light loss. Okay, makes sense. And physically, how does it look? Well, it's small standard IOL size. The very center, about 1.1 millimeters, is optimized just for distance vision. Then the spiral pattern starts and extends outwards to about 3.2 millimeters. That spiral region does the heavy lifting for the extended range of focus. Got it. So before putting this in people's eyes, they did some testing. The sources mention a dual approach, preclinical simulation and clinical trials. Why is that simulation part so important? Oh, it's crucial. It bridges that gap between bench testing, you know, lab measurements and actual human outcomes. And it does it non-invasively. The FDA is actually pushing for better models like this. How does it work? They use something called pseudophagic vision simulation. In this case, the RALV system. Basically, it lets healthy people with perfect vision experience what it's like to see through the lens as if it were implanted on their eye. Wow. So you can get subjective feedback like how bad are the halos almost instantly without waiting for surgery and healing. Exactly. You get immediate qualitative comparison data. So in this study, they had 30 participants compare the galaxy directly against Ray One's established trifocal IOL. It helps spot differences in visual quality right away. Okay, so what did that simulation show? Head-to-head, -head, galaxy versus trifocal. Visual acuity first. Overall range of focus was pretty comparable between the two. But there was a key difference. Where? Intermediate distance. The galaxy performed significantly better there. We're talking 0 0.03 log MR versus 0 0.08 log MR for the trifocal. Logmar numbers can be a bit abstract. Can you put that intermediate difference into perspective? What does that feel like for someone? Sure. Think about working on a computer. Better intermediate vision, like that 0.03 number, means you can likely read your screen comfortably, see spreadsheets clearly. 
The 0 0.08 might mean you're leaning in a bit, maybe straining slightly to get the same clarity. It's a tangible difference for daily tasks like computer work, seeing the car dashboard, cooking. Okay, that makes sense. Now the big one, halos and glare, the traditional Achilles heel. And this is where the simulation results were, well, pretty dramatic. The galaxy lens showed significantly less halo and glare. How significant? The halo glare size measured around 11.4 milliradians for the galaxy, compared to 21 milliradians for the trifocal. That's almost half. And the statistics were very strong, P less than 0 0.0001. It strongly suggests the spiral design fundamentally handles light better, less scatter. Okay, so the physics seemed to work in simulation, less scatter, potentially fewer complaints, but did the people prefer it? Objective data is one thing, subjective experience is another. And that lined up too. The participants showed a really strong, statistically significant preference for the galaxy across the board. All distances. Yep. 83% preferred it for distance vision, 80% for intermediate, and a huge 90% preferred it for near vision. Wow, 90% for near. Yeah. When you see that kind of overwhelming preference in a simulation, it's a very strong indicator that the visual quality difference is noticeable and meaningful to the person experiencing it. Okay, so the simulation paints a very positive picture. Let's move to the clinical trial. How did it perform in actual patients? Right, so this is a pooled analysis. Data came from 10 international sites looking at 73 patients, so 146 eyes in total, evaluated three months after surgery. And the refractive results, did the lens hit its targets? Pretty well, yeah. 87% of eyes were within plus or minus half a diopter of the target refraction at three months. That's right in line with current benchmarks, indicating good predictability. Good stability. And the actual vision, how well could people see? Excellent results there, too. Mean monocular corrected vision, so. With best correction in one eye, was better than 20-25 at all key distances. Distance, intermediate, and near. And binocularly, using both eyes together. Even better, as you'd expect. Binocular uncorrected distance vision, so no glasses at all for distance, was 20-20 or better in over 82% of patients. That's a strong result for spectacle independence, for driving, watching TV, etc. Okay, hitting the marks at specific distances is good. But the promise here was continuous vision. That means we need to look at the defocus curve, right? To see if there are gaps. Absolutely, the defocus curve is critical. Traditional multifocals can give you peaks of good vision, but then dips or valleys in between those peaks. The goal with a lens like the Galaxy is to smooth out those dips, create a high flat plateau of good vision across the entire range. That's what continuous vision really means. So did the Galaxy deliver that plateau in the clinical study? It seems so. Monocularly one eye, the visual acuity was 20-32 or better, all the way out to magus 2.50 diopters of defocus. Okay, and binocularly, both eyes working together. Binocularly, that good vision, 20-32 or better, extended even further, out to metis 2.80 diopters. Minus 2.80 diopters. Let's translate that number because that's really key for modern life. It really is. Minus 2.80 diopters corresponds roughly to a viewing distance of about 35 centimeters. That's your comfortable smartphone distance reading a book using a tablet. And the sources emphasized that the defocus curve showed this smooth plateau across that whole range, over 4.0 diopters in total, without the significant dips you sometimes see with lenses that rely on distinct intermediate focal points. So yes, it seems to deliver that continuous vision. That really seems to validate the whole AI design spiral concept clinically. Continuous range achieved. So if the range is good and continuous, what about the quality within that range? Back to contrast sensitivity. Right. Conscious sensitivity, how well you see in non-ideal conditions, like differentiating shades of gray. Pre-clinically, remember, the galaxy showed a significant advantage over the trifocal, specifically for near contrast. Which they linked to the non-diffractive design, less light splitting. Exactly. Less light loss should mean better contrast, especially for fine details up close. And clinically, did that hold up? Clinically, the contrast sensitivity results were reported as being within the normal range at three months. That held true under both bright light photopic conditions and dimmer mesopic conditions. So good functional vision quality. Okay, now the million dollar question for patient satisfaction. Real world halos and glare. Did that dramatic reduction seen in the simulation translate to happy patients? The clinical data here looks exceptionally good. I mean, really strong. The vast majority of patients reported minimal issues Get this, 95.4% experienced no or only mild halos. 95%, that's huge for a full range lens and glare. Even better, 100% experienced no or mild glare. Wow, 0% reporting moderate or severe glare. That's yeah. 
That's a game changer if it holds up long term, especially considering night driving issues with older multifocals. It's a very significant finding. They reported the mean halo size clinically was around 31.8. Now compare that to some previous studies of diffractive trifocals where mean halo sizes were reported up around 50.7. It's a substantial reduction. So the clinical dysphotopsia results really seem to back up the preclinical simulation and the core idea of the non-diffractive spiral design. Less scatter, fewer visual disturbances, higher comfort. That seems to be the story the data tells. High visual comfort alongside that full range of vision. Okay, fantastic results overall. But we always need to look critically. What were the limitations acknowledged in the source material? Good point. No study is perfect. The first main limitation is the follow-up duration. It was only three months. Right. Now, they did note that vision seemed stable between the one-month and three-month visits, which is encouraging. But sometimes... Full neuroadaptation, the brain getting completely used to the new optics, can take a bit longer, maybe up to six months. So longer term data would be ideal. Okay, three months is relatively short. What else? The other big one, structurally, is about the clinical trial design itself. How so? It lacked a direct contemporary control group within the clinical trial. They compared the galaxy's clinical results to benchmarks and historical data from other lenses, like trifocals. But they didn't randomize patients in the same study to get either the galaxy or, say, the Ray-1 trifocal and compare them head-to-head -head clinically. Exactly. So while the galaxy's results look excellent on their own and compare favorably to historical data, we don't have that direct simultaneous clinical comparison from this specific study to definitively quantify the magnitude of the clinical improvement over, say, that trifocal lens. The simulation showed a big difference, but a head-to-head -head clinical trial would be the ultimate proof. Got it. So the simulations suggested a massive jump. The clinical results are excellent standing alone, but a direct comparative clinical trial is still needed to confirm the size of that advantage in patients. Precisely. Future comparative studies will be really important. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Summing up our deep dive today. Well, the Raywin Galaxy IOL based on this research, really seems to deliver on its promise. It showed excellent, uninterrupted, full-range vision clinically. That unique AI-designed refractive spiral seems to successfully provide that continuous focus from distance all the way to near. And critically, it seems to do it with high visual quality. Yes, that's key. The significantly reduced rates of troublesome halos and glare reported by patients clinically, along with good contrast sensitivity, points towards high visual comfort. It really supports the idea that avoiding diffractive optics can minimize those common patient complaints. So what this all means is, well, it, it suggests this non-diffractive spiral approach could be a really promising way forward. Moving beyond the old compromises to get truly continuous high-quality vision without needing glasses after cataract surgery, it feels like a potential step change. It definitely moves the needle on solving that core trade-off between range and quality. All right, and as always, we leave you with a final thought to chew on. Given how remarkably well the results from that non-invasive preclinical simulation where healthy people essentially test drove the lens, predicted the actual clinical outcomes, especially regarding halos and glare. Mm -hmm. The alignment was quite striking. It raises a big question, doesn't it, for regulators, for manufacturers. Should this kind of pseudophagic vision simulation become a standard, maybe even mandatory step before launching large, expensive, time-consuming clinical trials for new IOL designs? That's a really interesting question. If simulation can reliably predict key aspects of patient experience and potential problems like dysphotopsia with this kind of accuracy, what well, could potentially make the whole development process for new eye technologies faster, safer, and maybe even more efficient? Definitely food for thought. Indeed. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. We'll see you next time.